Give it up for Barbara Mame. Thanks. Hey guys, how are you? Way! <laughs> Uh, so we are going to have a round of uh, flash talks now. Some of you guys may be uh, used to it because we, we have a lot of those uh, at Bangalore GS. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to do that at GS for this time. Um, so we'll have nine flash talks, five minutes each, not one second more than that. John down here is holding a big timer and he's, he's putting the pressure on the speakers. So I, I will need a little bit of your help too, so please don't ask questions during the talk. Let, let them do their thing, and if you want to catch up with them afterwards, I'm sure they'll stick around for a while. Okay, guys, so let's start with Maulik. Hello. Uh, good evening, awesome people. So, first of all, I would like to start with the thank you to JSFU and Bangalore JS for this awesome event and uh, letting few people of us like to have a flash talk. So, I'll start without wasting my time. So, this is not me. Uh, cool. Where is my presentation? Okay, so I'll start with a question that how many of you have ever created your resume with LaTeX? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Only ten. So, so actually that's why uh, I have started uh, doing research on these things and started creating a tool that will take the help of LaTeX for creating the resume. So, it's a, when you start like LaTeX Resume Maker, you will get a second link, this is cvsintellect.com. I'm there inside, it will take some time to load, as usual. So, basically we have, we have used... Uh, cool. So, so it's here. So, let's get started, like how actually it's very easy to do that. Uh, do, do. It's very time taking. So basically, we are using Angular uh, for front-end and uh, LaTeX and JSP for uh, rendering your resume and uh, for giving data to, like, passing data in JSON format to the uh, library. So, poof. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cool. We, I want to, I would like to do without registering. Yes. Whatever it is. Blah, blah. Yeah, let's import data from LinkedIn. And da, da, da. Oof. So basically, it, it will take just two to three minutes to create your resume, and uh, you can directly send it to recruiters from our site only. So, so. If internet is fast. <laughs> Ooh. Cool. So it's loading. Cool, so it's Hemant's computer and he was logged in in LinkedIn, so it, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but our data is here now. So, 
all his data is here. He can directly do a preview. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry, we are not. You are trying without registering, so don't worry about that. So let's do preview. Yeah. Select a resume is ready. It's very slow. Cool. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Meanwhile, it's rendering. Let's see the. Yeah, it's there. It's re resume is ready. All his data. So a uh, few features that we are giving is uh, you can change the template. Like if you like this, this design, just click it, save it, and uh, refresh the tab. It will change the design. <laughs> Question outside. <laughs> so it's here. Then. Uh, you can rearrange the sections if you want, or you can directly send write email ID of recruiters and directly send it. That's it. So I don't have time to speak. talk more about it. Uh, we're looking for the other hand mic. It's right here. Okay. Hello. Okay. It's okay. Uh, hi everyone. So, um, uh, okay. So, uh, let's say uh, I'm the browser and he's the server. He's Chetan, my friend. I'm Param. So, uh, in the past, we built websites which work something like this. So, the user asked me for the homepage. Okay. Hey, server, give me the homepage. Yep. Rendering the HTML. Take the nav. User, the navigation bar. Take the sidebar. Okay, the sidebar. Take the content. Okay, user, the site is ready for you. Oh, you want the profile page. Server, give me the profile page. Yeah, rendering the HTML. Take okay. the nav. Okay. Take the sidebar. Navigate uh, sidebar ready. Take the profile content. Okay. User, the profile page is ready. So you see how on each refresh, uh, every time I'm asking the server for the HTML. Now we are cool guys, right? We code in JavaScript. So we make a cool AngularJS or Backbone front-end app. So let's see how that works. So I'm a cool app now. Yes, hey, server, give me the, give me my app. Yeah, I'll take the scripts. Okay. Okay, user, wait, I'm loading the scripts. Okay. You want the home page? Give me the home page content. Yeah, take the home page content. Okay, I'm rendering it. Okay, user, this page is ready. Oh, you want the profile page? Just give me the profile content. Yeah, take the profile content. Okay, I just swap out the original content with the profile content. Now, yeah, that's good. On each response, it went out quite fast, but the initial load was bad, right? On Gmail, like you, how you see it, it there's a big loading bar in the beginning. You just want to see your mail. Uh, there's some new mail that has come. You just want to see that. So there's got to be something better, right? So how do you do that? So there's, this is something, this is a weekend project we have done, and we have used this concept, a third concept which you should be using. So what happens is, um, let's go to the home page. Cool, the net is good. I search for cafe. What this app does is uh, you can tell your friends where you are heading so so they can catch up with you. So whatever you search um, will get shared to Facebook. Okay. Uh, this is working. So I'm searching for cafe. I hope that works. Yeah. So I select this. Now, um, what happens is this view that got rendered down here was rendered by my web app. So I can search for anything else and then that would get rendered. So, so let's search for some mall. Okay. Now, okay, so again, the, just the API call was done and the web app rendered it. Okay. Now, uh, it can also uh, do back and forth. So, I can go, I can go back and forth. So using HTML, HTML5 posted, right? Everyone knows that. Now, this is a typical, it might seem like a typical web app, right? But what happens is, I can copy this URL, open it in a new tab, and see, it just like a flash, it showed up. Because this time, the HTML is rendered by the server. 
So the whole point of this talk was that please take the effort in any web app you are building, uh, mimic your app, uh, mimic your uh, view rendering code both on the client and the server so that you can see it's, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, ES6, Harmony, the future is already here. Uh, probably they ended two minutes early, probably I can eat up their two minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, this is about me, you can find me there. And uh, if you do uh, V8 options and grep for some harmful stuff, you can find all of these options is already enabled in VI, so we can use Harmony right now. It's not the future, it's right here uh, on the latest build. And I have written a small one-liner to pump in all the flags, and we are ready to go. Let me try. Uh, block scoping. Hmm. Where wife equals one. Cool. And let girlfriend be 10. Not bad. Uh, cool. Now if you say wife, uh, it will say one. Now let's see girlfriend counts undefined as expected, because this is a block scoping where you could see those let keyword and the braces. As, as of now, JavaScript was all function scoped, and we have block scoping now. Um, let's try generator. Uh, let's create a generator. Generators normally give out iterators, as we know. Uh, star is added there. I'll let you know why, why that, that is done. And where c equals 0, then while true, or probably we'll make it more like uh, yield. This is why we need a star there. Yield is not a keyword yet. And that's why we need a star there. So a, a counter generator is ready. Now let's create a, we need a var here because it's running on strict mode. Let's, let's create an iterator. Uh, okay, if you see count, there's nothing there. But if you do a next, because an iterator will have an next there. And you, you keep on getting that. Uh, and done would be true if the iterator, uh, generator stops generating. Here it doesn't stop because it's an infinite loop there. So you keep on generating. Um, let's try modules now. Uh, We'll, have, we'll, we'll do the same similar thing. We'll call it ticker. Say where c equals zero again. And this is module, so it will export functions. Uh, let, let, it say, let it export an incrementer. So that would return a plus plus c again. Right, it seems fine. Ah, uh, okay, cool. Now we have ticker. If you do a ticker, uh, uh, it's empty, but, you, but if you do a C, you don't get it, even though if it's defined there, because it's a module there. And you can use an increment there, you keep on getting different values. All right, uh, now let's say, let's try proxy. I have two and a half minutes left, man, okay. I wanted to show you object observers also. Um, let's create a proxy. Mm, let's put a trap for a get. Mm, let's, uh, it gets an object and the value. Um, let's return value equals say answer. Uh, we'll return 42. We know the answer. If not, it's 420. You know 420 also, right? So, if you say life dot answer, you get 420. I mean 42 because we are checking there. If you say like anything else, you get 420. So this can be like the method missing in Ruby. Okay, let's try object observers. This way, like, ah, uh, good. Thank you. The strict mode. Object observer uh, will observe the person object that will give you a callback of changes uh, and just just log the changes and see how it goes, man. Okay, now if you do a person dot name equals Hemant, you could see that, right? Like. So whatever is being logged, it, it, its type of new and object got a uh, attribute of name. Then if you if you go ahead and delete it, you could see that it was deleted, and what was deleted, right? You can do the same thing for an um, array probably. An array has a different uh, observer of its own. Say like, okay. I have 40 seconds left, not bad. All 
right? Uh, so we do list dot pop. You could see that, right? We could also do a similar thing on push, right? So uh, apart from this, we have uh, maps, weak maps, symbols. Uh, so uh, some of them are not implemented, and uh, thank you for your patience. Enjoy. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> I want to let you know all that there is nothing in this world and we are all one connected to the universe. All atoms are nothing but strings and there is, all these things are done out of ego. Actually, <laughs> that was supposed to be JavaScript enlightenment and I ventured into wrong, wrong topic. Uh, this is a 20-minute talk, uh, kind of crushed into a 5-minute talk. So I'll go over it quickly, and I wasted some time already. So <clears throat> we, a lot of us are, uh, you know, trapped into that framework and tools and uh, design patterns and this and that problems. But a lot of us has to see JavaScript as a language itself. It is a first-class programming language. You know, it's a functional programming language. There's a lot that can be done through JavaScript. There's a lot that has been done through JavaScript and a lot of things have been going on. So <clears throat> I'll just point at a few resources uh, which are mostly books uh, through which you can kind of like upgrade your skills of the programming language itself, uh, not really worrying about anything else. <clears throat> uh, I'm Dawal Trivedi on Twitter if you want to check me out. Uh, and uh, the philosophy is this. <laughs> uh, we cannot solve the problems with the same level of thinking that created them. So if we are always in the you know, doing CRUD apps and uh, thinking in DOM and, you know, uh, thinking in a JAX request. We are ne never going to go beyond that. So I think we need to break that and move on. And we know uh, JavaScript is probably everywhere. Uh, uh, I think there's one more project that I think you might have checked out. As per you know, it's already kind of like Arduino with JavaScript. You can do firmware programming with JavaScript. Uh, I'll show you some more examples in the end. So you need to learn how to think in JavaScript. That's the most important part. Uh, I'll, I'll show you why thinking is very important. Uh, started experimenting with Vim, which is obviously the number one uh, code editor, uh, hands down. <laughs> uh, and the way you can use Vim is to start thinking in Vim. Once you start thinking in Vim, the code just flows. And obviously, Emacs is number two. Uh, uh, Matt Swen started using Emacs, he eventually discovered Lisp and, you know, uh, that uh, uh, eventually led him writing Ruby, uh, which you cannot do using Sublime, of course. Uh, okay, so how do you think in JavaScript? Uh, so how do you think in JavaScript? For that, you need to answer, what is JavaScript? And what is JavaScript leads to Nirvana? JavaScript is nothing but Lisp in C's clothing. This is very important. If you know this, you, you can, you know, use JavaScript to your uh, uh, advantage and whatever else you can. Um, uh, there's a nice person who said that JavaScript has more in common with functional languages like per scheme than with C or Java. And uh, no, I think <laughs> I think uh, that was uh, Crockford, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's very important. How do you think in Lisp? Uh, you need to go through resources which will allow you to think in Lisp. It's very important to think in Lisp and think functional. I think there's a good book called Little Schemer, which is a very small book, but it, it, it kind of uh, forces you to think functional, think recursion, think in the way you are not uh, usually thinking. Then there is a book called LOL, uh, which is nothing but Land of Lisp, which is the next level. Uh, if you can, uh, uh, you know, have a copy of this book, it, re it is awesome. If you are feeling adventurous, you should go through SICP, which is, of course, the, uh, Alm I, I don't know, what do you say, Bible of the uh, computer programming. It's also based on uh, functional programming. And 
Uh, if you want to go for inner functions, uh, inner internal workings of the computer, you can go through the book called Code. Now, what's being done in JavaScript and what is the power of hardcore programming? This is a game that won JS1K. It's written in 1KB. Uh, this is a game that, that also won JS1K. It is a full-fledged chess game written in 1KB along with the AI. So you can play with computer. Uh, <laughs> last but not the least, this is an open risk simulator written in JavaScript that is running Linux on the browser client side. So I think this is where JavaScript is. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, sorry, this thing is in continuous scroll mode, and all my animations have gone to hell. But that's what I get for not using slides. Huh? Uh, so my name is Sahil. Uh, I'm an engineer from IIT Madras, though not the kind of engineer that you guys are. I, I did my engineering in metallurgy. And after that, I did a bunch of things that have nothing to do with this entire room. Uh, after which, uh, I even worked at a startup in the middle. Uh, called Easy Tab, where I built a mobile point of sale terminal. Uh, what you need to know about me, all of this is irrelevant. Uh, I grew up in a factory. Uh, my father uh, owns and operates a paint factory. So I grew up in paint factories, and for me, the whole thing was uh, I'm most comfortable and happy in a factory. It's why I became an engineer. I like making, I mean, I like being inside factories, I like looking at big machines. And for me, a lot of people keep talking about Internet of Things, and uh, for most people, that's there. It's in personal and home. But for me, uh, it was a very crowded space, and I would rather spend my time making factories faster, making factories connected. And uh, so I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what, what that's like and what, what happens there in factories. So these are the guys currently connecting factories. Uh, Rockwell, Honeywell, Emerson, Schneider, what they basically do is they bring a bunch of sensors and instrumentation, and then or draw cables, literally break down walls and draw cables through the whole thing. It takes about two to three months in a uh, you know, facility of a couple of acres. And then finally, bring it to one computer. In the entire premises, the pro poor production plant engineer will have one desktop on which that uh, all the wires will come and connect. And then uh, it's called a HMI, human machine interface, uh, so to speak. I mean, pretty much anything that we use is an HMI today especially computers. But the whole point is they make, uh, they, they make these things that, that run only on a one kind of lo like a local system. And the problem is it's wired and local. Because it's local, it's high cost. Because it's wired, sorry, not because it's local. And you can't really change anything. Once you've put this workbench program on the local server, there's, it's done. So uh, at least me and my team think that this, this is begging for disruption. So what do they do with these systems once they're put in place? All kinds of things, but most commonly the smallest things that are used most often are the ones that need to be connected. Pumps, motors, valves. Uh, that's an RFID chip to, to track location of things. Uh, so you want actuators to actually turn valves when something happen, uh, when, when the pressure builds for too long, or uh, you want motors to basically be switched on to fill up a tank or things like that. Or you know, even in the oil field, you have remote uh, remote sensing equipment. So, I mean, a lot of stuff, I mean, there's a lot of need for this stuff to be connected, specifically in the industrial application. What's wrong with this picture? For me, this is the architecture of a local, uh, of a traditional SCADA system. Uh, SCADA system stands for supervisory control and data acquisition, which basically means they pick up data from all these field parameters and show it to you on this local system. For me, that's what's wrong with this picture. Uh, it's it's really if and and if you go there, that's not all that's wrong. These are all actual HMIs. The the uh, that one was built by Honeywell. That one was built by a company called Entech. This don't even ask me. But the fact is that I can't look at any one of these without going blind. Uh, and I have no freaking clue what's going on. I'm a, I mean I understand process engineering fairly well, but that doesn't make any sense to me. So. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, my only question is why? Why, why are you doing this? Uh, so for me, uh, what what my, my my vision and the team's vision really is to build an OS for the real world. And and the way we do that is building using wireless sensors. Things have to be wireless. Moment they come, they should just tag on to these in, uh, to the instrumentation that is available. 
I want to use the cloud and use a uh, data layer on the cloud and then nicely show it up uh, using, uh, you know, lovely charting libraries like D3 or, well, I can't use D3 because those buggers use IE. So I'll probably have to go to like Raphael or something, but you know, uh, at least that will be better than what they do. Um, so what we do essentially uh, is build these systems on the cloud wirelessly. So all these kind of sensors, motors, actuators, all the things that are there, we build these RTUs, they're called remote terminal units that pair with them and wirelessly send the data straight to the cloud. Once it's on the cloud, you know, it, uh, anything goes, right? You open up uh, dashboards, APIs, all of that stuff, but pretty much reporting and even predictive analytics. I've run out of time. One last shameless plug, I'm looking for devs, as usual, why would I be here? All right, thanks, you guys. Hey guys, uh, I am Ashish, also known as Pocha. I am the founder of uh, a website called CodeLearn. I am not sure how many of you have heard of it. So uh, I had a problem. So uh, CodeLearn is about you have a Ruby on Rails tutorial on the website, and we also emulate the complete Rails uh, backend on the browser. Uh, what is it? that also means that we also provide a terminal in the browser. Uh, uh, we ended up, we started with an open source terminal, but ended up using our own custom terminal. And this talk is about how we developed our own terminal, uh, which right now is in Node.js. Uh, so uh, this, the right audience for this talk is somebody like me who never knew Node.js and wanted to start with, and probably there is something very quick, you can look at it and get started. Or uh, somebody who wants to look into something called SOCJS, which is probably better maintained than socket.io at this point of time. So the terminal looks something like this. Uh, uh, the screenshot is there. Uh, th this is a pseudo terminal, so it is not really an actual terminal. So not uh, when in an actual terminal, every key press gets reported. So you probably see some lag when you type. Uh, but this is like a, you write something and then you press enter and all the data goes back and something comes up and it shows up. Uh, this is the typical life cycle that we gone through uh, why and when we came up with this thing. Uh, we used gate one to start with. Uh, it has a lot of quirks, so it is again an open source thing. Uh, then we ended up creating a version in Ruby because I knew a lot of Ruby. I didn't really knew uh, Node.js at this point of time. Uh, it has significant delay. Uh, I tried Fay. Uh, it's again a Ruby in again Ruby. and. Uh, it has its own set of quirks. Uh, then I ended up trying SOCJS and the server-side logic uh, is basically written in Node.js. Uh, this is the typical architecture. So SOCJS client is on the browser. On the right, you see the server. It uses a library called pty.js, uh, which eventually spawns uh, one process for every user that connected that, that connected on the browser. This is a small piece of code which would typically explain everything. Uh, I mean, uh, overall the code size is like 150 lines of code, I would say, both server and client side. Uh, the left side is the server side code. I'll not go through it much. Probably you guys can look at it. But this is typically what's happening, that SOCJS is uh, creating a socket, and uh, when the data comes in, it is being fed to the terminal. So we pty.js uh, spawns a terminal for the user. and uh, this is this this would typically give you uh, an idea of how it's happening. Uh, I have before coming to the talk, I have also stripped down. Uh, this is an open source project, by the way. Uh, before coming to the talk, I have stripped down and I have put it out uh, in that pocha dot uh, sorry github dot com pocha terminal demo. You can probably have a look at it if you want. Uh, uh, there is a live demo also at the above URL, but probably you guys can check it out. And I don't want to spend your time. Uh, showing you what it is. Uh, for the people who are looking to use it on production, there are some of the gotchas. 
uh one thing it's a pseudo terminal and sometimes uh, the cpu actually hits a 100% spike i mean we have a eight core server so only one of the core get, gets on to 100% cpu so and i've heard i mean my debugging shows that it's a pty.js which is the culprit and their uh, uh, their documentation also shows that it's uh, kind of unstable so uh, don't use it i mean it's on production at this point of time on codelan website but for you probably it's not a good idea to do it yet so yeah, that's that's typically about this talk. Uh, all right. Hi, my name is Aravind. Uh, I work for this company called Scrollback. It's a startup. And if you've been to the Hasgeek website recently, uh, and you hit the IRC channel link at the top, you have this uh, chat window pop up, which is linked to their IRC channel. So this is what we do. That ends the self-promotion part of this talk. Uh, okay, Ashish just gave you the uh, answer to this one, but I was I intended to you know ask this as a question. Um, this talk is about what libraries uh, you would you know how you would go about choosing a library uh, or for your Node.js project. I mean, if especially if you intend to use it in production, uh, you know you need to find a library that is still actively maintained. And between these two, uh, you know, Socket IO is a lot more a uh, lot more popular. You know, people have heard of it more, but it turns out that it's not so well maintained anymore. And uh, Socket.js would be the one, uh, I mean, we learned this the hard way. We used Socket.io first, and then we switched to, uh, switched to Socket.js uh, recently. So uh, you know, this has happened to us a couple of times. And so I have this kind of informal rule of thumb of how I would go about choosing a library. I would go to the GitHub uh, page for that. And this is the uh, dead project checklist. So I would check if it has any recent commits, obviously. Uh, I would look at the issues and the pull requests, but I wouldn't look at the open ones. I would look at the frequency with which uh, pull requests are closed and issues are closed. And I would, uh, you know, if I can't choose between two libraries based on these, I would read up on the actual issues and, uh, you know, what people say. Uh, a couple of things that aren't, aren't great indicators of which library is better maintained is what the maintainer says about whether it's maintained or not. And, with, and uh, you know, uh, the data on on the npm, the metadata on npm, like you know, what was the latest release date and all that. Uh, now, we also faced another issue where we picked a library which was fairly well maintained, and then we ended up using a feature within the library which was not so well maintained, uh, and that is um, you know the Node MySQL library, which is like you know very very popular, and uh, it turns out that their focus right now is on building the connection pooling, and if you use uh, you know, single connect connections to talk to your MySQL um, database, it, it crashes after a very long time, like two days or so. Um, yeah, so this is this is another issue that you face, and uh, you know, you the way around is to just re rebuild your application with the new and you know more maintained feature set. And quite often, you find that you know there is no alternative. There's just one library out there which you can use, which serves your need, and that's not so well maintained anymore. And then you need to ask yourself two things. One, um, can I maintain this? I mean, if, if I run into issues using this, can I, can I maintain this? Uh, so the answer to that was yes for us, uh, for this library, Node IRC. So we found issues on it, and we figured out we could fix this and uh, use it in production for ourselves. And another one was. Um, uh, node identity, which we need to connect to free node and all that. And uh, it turns out uh, that it was not worth our time trying to maintain it. It was much easier to just build one ourselves. So this is like the overall uh, flowchart that you need to kind of go through to pick a library to use in Node.js. Uh, that's my email address. That's it.
Hi guys, uh, I'm here to just to show you how to. Hi guys, I'm here to show you how to get India map just in five lines of code in Node.js. No, it's there. Okay. And uh, where's the source code? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's the code, which is like just five lines. Okay. Uh, I could see how we could do this. I'll just. Okay. Here it is. So. Just I just expanded it how to uh, for our understanding. Okay, just uh, we have the uh, codes in obfuscated, and uh, here is what I am doing. Just we are getting we have assigned a equal to ten and b equal to zero, c equal to ten, c is equal to ten. Just to uh, I'll explain why we have done that and three just to get the explanation mark. Okay, and uh, here first we are getting the first character of India here that is T. Okay, and we are doing just. B plus plus. So I'm just saying that uh, we are going to the next one, and I'm always checking here. A is greater than 64 because like T, it's greater than 64. Okay, so I'm just doing minus minus and C plus plus. So that's what like uh, here the C is. I'm using just to get the 80 lines. Okay, and uh, when I'm if you see if C is equal to 90, that's we have to go to the next line. That's what it's being done. Where here I'm just to C is equal to uh, I get it as 10. So it prints. This okay, it goes to the next line, and here I'm just uh, getting one and zero. Okay, uh, okay, I'm just checking whether it's one and zero. And based if it is uh, one, we just print exclamation mark. Okay, and uh, if it is zero, we just print a blank space. Okay, and uh, how do I control C? Control C. Okay. I'm not used to Mac. I use Ubuntu. Okay, so oops. okay. So here, if you see, uh, just uh, these are the characters, the S, P, P, O. All these are the uh, characters of India. Okay, then again. I'm just changing the code here. Two minutes more. Sorry. Okay. And. Um, oops. It's not safe. So this is how it's being done. Okay, you could see ones and zeros. Uh, just found this code in C plus plus. I thought of converting into JS. Okay, and uh, yeah, here you could see the source code. Uh, if you want the source code, it's already there. Okay, thank you. Okay, quickly I'll tell you what it is, okay? Imagine you work for an e-commerce site which sells shoes and chaddis and t-shirts, possibly named Mintra. Uh, you, could be, uh, you could be working for a company called Flipkart, it could be with Clear Trip. Generally, they have a search experience. You search for something, you see a bunch of results. On the left, there'll be filters, you'll tap, 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 it'll do a little spinny thing and show you the results. I don't like that, I like animations, and I want it to be seamless. I want you to be able to generate it using your template, take it, dump it, the module should animate, figure out what the elements are, and animate it into place. So. The demo that I have, I'm going to be generating 20 numbers between 0 to 30. All right. Then every two seconds, I'm generating 20 more random numbers between 0 and 30. And it threw it at my module, and it's going to figure out 
uh, which ones need to leave, which ones stay in place, which ones animate into place. Okay, that's it. That's the demo. So it starts off, I have a bunch of numbers, and every two seconds it's stuck, uh, generating HTML, spitting at it. You can see it morphing into different colors. I have timestamps on everything. None of these elements are absolutely positioned, so you should be able to use it with code that you already have. Let's try resizing this. Come on. Oh, yeah, I'll just, come on, just, let's, yeah, okay, so I can just do that, and it will work on your phone, and it will work on your widescreen browser. You could take your general search experience that you have right now, and, that's it. That's oh, that's all I got. It it just works. Okay. Under a minute and a half. Yes. Oh, you want to see code? Oh, I'll show you code. Yeah, all right. Okay, I'll show you code. Yeah, sure. No worries. How do I write? It's not. It's not. <laughs> flash talk. Uh, how do I say view source on this dude? Uh, huh? Oh, it, command shift U two. <laughs> okay, so uh, you <laughs> you can look at this. So I'm generating a bunch of uh, <laughs> random numbers, uh, and I spit like you know it just generates this te uh, this template over here. This uh, so this generates a div, right? If you go down here, ta -da -ta. wait, let's see, let's see. I'm not even sure. I haven't seen this code in a bit. I uh, yeah okay. So yeah, basically populate this. Okay, I'm uh, generating a ran random array of nodes. It's a append child. And every two seconds, I just generate another 20 nodes and spit it at shuffle module. Do you want to see the actual module, how big it is? GitHub URL, github.com slash 3.1 slash shuffle. 3.1 is pi. Uh, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the code. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's built with Morpheus. There's no jQuery anywhere. Ha, <laughs> uh, I like Morpheus for animations, and I use just, there's no like selector engine or anything. Uh, there's even a string helper, so you can generate HTML at it. Uh, right now I'm using DOM nodes, but yeah, you can generate one HTML string, throw it at it. There's a little function that it uses to figure out which nodes are the same uh, and which ones actually generate. Uh, you can do a little sorting. That's how it does sorting over here. So, yeah, dude. That's it. That's, uh, that's all I got, man. Thank you. Still under four minutes. So uh, this is amazing. We are actually four minutes early, guys. Woohoo! <laughs> so since we have four minutes left, I would like to ask uh, all the Flash Talkers to come on stage so that we can all applaud them, give them a big round of applause because they did a great job and they played the game quite well. Congrats, guys. And I suggest for uh, next year's JSFU, we do only flash talks. <laughs>